Bishop Joseph L. Garlington Sr. is the senior pastor of Covenant Church of Pittsburgh and is widely acclaimed for both his teaching and music ministry. He is an accomplished musician, recording artist, author and scholar, whose work reaches thousands via his weekly television broadcast, national and international conferences, albums, books and articles. He's internationally recognized in the religious community for his work and ministry in many churches in South Africa since 1979. His preaching and teaching ministry, known for its humor and deep insight, has made him a popular speaker at many national conferences. Bishop Garlington regularly consults for pastors, churches and organizations that are eager to develop models of racial reconciliation and healing. He is married to Barbara Williams Garlington and together they share responsibility for seven children, 13 grandchildren, one great-granddaughter and one great-grandson. We are excited to receive Bishop Joseph Garlington today at this present house. Let's give him a warm TPH welcome. Are you here? Say, I'm here. Good, so are we. You may be seated. Worship, just great. Thank you so much for being open, your passion for God. It's just a joy to be in a place where people are happy about being saved. Are you happy about being saved? Oh, yeah. Yes, good. You know, I was, I was thinking as we were in worship, I had a dream many, many years ago that um, about my sister having a baby, and uh, the truth was she was getting ready to adopt one. But in the dream, I saw a picture of the baby. I didn't know that it was going to be her baby, but the baby was so beautiful. The baby's eyes were like. Uh, eyes of love you 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 felt like when you looked into her eyes you wanted to dive right in to those eyes so full of love and this is what I sense this morning with your worship there was such love in your worship till you just wanted to dive in and just move around and let it wash you what a tribute to our Lord and Savior with your worship this morning. It was excellent. Amen. You know, I'm, I'm not a singer, but in heaven I'm going to sing. Hallelujah. <laughs> so until that happens, I carry my singer with me. <laughs> Father, we thank you for being here in your presence. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit who's going to direct my husband in what he's going to say. So give you praise and honor for this house, for the wonderful pastor and his beautiful wife, and this congregation of believers, and it's evident how much they love you. We love you, Bishop. Preach, preach, preach. preach, preach, preach. Amen. Let it overflow, let it overflow, let it overflow, let it overflow. How easy is that? Let it overflow. 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 
the writer said, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God. They've always been that way. The weapons of our warfare. You remember the story. After the rock had yielded water, the Amalekites came. Whenever you get water, the enemy says, I want that water. And so Moses and Aaron and Hur, they go up to the mountain, and Joshua's in the valley. He's doing the fighting. And as long as Moses' arms were, the battle went against the enemy. When his arms came down, the battle went against God's people. Now Joshua's down here. He doesn't know what's going on. He just knows, hey, sometimes we're doing good, sometimes we're not doing good. He doesn't know that his progress is based upon hands that are lifted. Some people have a hard time with hands, especially evangelicals. They think hands is a, is a charismatic thing. And I tell them, I said, if you walk up to the bank to do a transaction and as you got to the door and got ready to pull it open and you saw everybody in the bank with their hands up, you wouldn't say Pentecostal worship service. In fact, you'd say, I'll come back later. Because hands up are a universal sign of surrender. But they're also a universal sign of victory. They're a universal sign of winning. They're a universal sign. In fact, the Bible says when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they came out with high hand. High hand lifted. It, you know, it's like saying, we're out of here and we got your money. Hands lifted. The two men who held up the hands, hands lifted. Hands lifted. Or as they say in the rap music, you can put them down now. Get your hands up. Get your hands up. Why? Aaron, the priest, her, Judah, priest and praise, intercession and praise. You can't lose with that stuff. And so what happens in the Bible is that we see various kinds of warfare take place. Elisha calls the king to come in. And Elisha's getting ready to be the Lord. And he says to the king, take your arrow and shoot it out the window. And he says, that arrow is a, a victory over the Syrians. He says, now take your arrows and do what? Come on, strike the ground. And so they struck the ground. He struck the ground. And he struck the ground three times. And Elisha was frustrated. He says, come on, man. You should have struck the ground six or seven times. Then you would have utterly defeated your enemy. Now I'm thinking, Elisha, you didn't tell him how many times to strike. He, yeah, I didn't. I just said strike the ground. I didn't say strike the ground three times. Well, what should he have done? He should have struck the ground until I told him, that's enough. We quit too soon. But if you don't quit, you win. I said, if you don't quit, you win. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battle. 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 Not no, got it. Hang on a second. All right, here's it. We say this is how I fight my battles. We do that six times. And then we say, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. You say, where did that come from? Oh, that came oh. from 2 Kings. Second King. When the king of when Syria found out that Elisha was his problem, he sent the whole army. And the army surrounded Elisha and his servant. And his servant says, we're in trouble. He says, no, no, you're not seeing things. And he says, God opened his eyes. And when he opened his eyes, 
he saw that they weren't just surrounded but they were surrounded by chariots of fire it may look like i'm surrounded but i'm surrounded by you it may look like i'm surrounded but i'm young man living in Brazil pastor I just love you man just you have this grace on your life my wife says when she gets to heaven she's gonna sing when I get to heaven I'm gonna be tall <laughs> and thin it's not good to be tall and thick but tall and thin A macaw is a beautiful multicolored bird. Brazil has a lot of them. And the young man was living in Brazil, and he'd been there for about seven years, and so he said to his friend, I'm not going to get home for Christmas, but I want to do something for my dad. And he said, why don't you get him a macaw? It can speak words, you can teach it to sing, it can whistle, it can make sounds. And you can even teach it different languages. And he said, great. And so he searched around the city and found this beautiful bird. And it was capable of two languages, Portuguese and English. He says, OK, I'll buy that for my dad. How much is it? And the store owner said, this is a trained bird. And it's going to cost $7,000. He said, OK, my dad's worth it. He said, "Where?" are you going to send the bird? He said, I'm going to send it to Atlanta. He said, then you're going to have to pay for the inoculation and for transportation. He said, what will that cost? He says, about $3,000, $10,000. He said, my dad's worth it. And so they package the bird, get it all ready, get all the papers signed, and they send it off. Three days after Christmas, he calls home and he says, Dad, he said, hi, son. He said, did you get the bird? He said, I sure did, and it was delicious. <laughs> did you eat the bird? Sure did. Ate it for Christmas dinner, had giblet gravy, cranberry sauce, the whole works. Had some friends over it. He said, Dad. I paid a fortune for that bird. That bird could speak two languages. His father was real quiet for a moment, then he finally said, well, he should have said something. <laughs> now, what I want to say to you is that you're capable of two languages, an earthly and a heavenly. And there are moments in your life when you need to say something. And when you can't resist some of the things that are taking place, you step back. Vinny is a pastor of mine and who lives in one of my pastors, lives in New Jersey, and his sons were terrorized by a crazy, crazy movie. And it scared them. And so finally when they went to bed, they said, Dad, come here, come here. Something's in the room. And so Vinny comes into the room and says, what is it? He says, we watched this scary movie and now we're scared. Pray for us. And so Vinny started, and did it for about 10 minutes. He says, you feeling better? He says, yes. 
in the room. He goes back, and a half hour later, Dad, come back, it's back. He comes back into the room, and he says, I bind this in the name of Jesus. And one of his sons says, no, not like that, Dad. Use that funny language. It feels better when you do that. <laughs> I want to talk about why God would have given you another language. And the reason I took this little detour is because when we were singing, this is how I fight my battles. There were just about 20 of you. But I need all of y'all to get involved. If you haven't spoken in tongues lately, you need to join us in doing it. Because when I show you what they mean to you and what God intends to happen in your life, it will be healing. It will be transforming. All right, take a deep breath. Get ready. Get ready. Jesus said to his disciples, I am going to give you another comforter. And that word another, it could easily be transferred, I'm going to give you a comforter or a helper just like me. Because it will be me in another form. Jesus in his humanity as a man, he can be in one place at one time. And when Jesus speaks concerning healing or deliverance, here's how he says it. He says, if I by the Spirit cast out demons, then the Holy Ghost, the kingdom of God, has come near you. That the challenge that you and I face is thinking that it's the way I say it that causes healing to take place. I was watching a woman praying for a demonized girl and as she's praying for her, I was watching her because I was raised in a setting where when you cast out a demon, you have to express authority and you, you use your voice and you use your countenance. Your face has to become ugly because you're going after an ugly demon. I bind you in the name of Jesus. And I've seen, I've seen them come out. And the thinking is that they came out because you exercised. But I was watching this lady, and she was saying, Drive it out, Holy Spirit. Just drive it out. <laughs> drive it out, Holy Spirit. She's, and I'm looking at her and saying, You're doing that all wrong. If you want that thing to come out, you're going to have to let it know you're in charge. But she didn't hear me. I was talking to myself anyway. Drive it out, Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, this girl sighed. She just, in her countenance, it radiated. I said, isn't that amazing? God. And I said, Jesus, that's easy. He said, my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. You want to cast out demons? You need to learn how I do it. And I do it by the Holy Spirit. So if Jesus says to a demonized man who's got enough demons in him to terrorize 2,000 pigs, when he says to that demonized man, that demon spirit, come out in the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit says, I'll take it from here. I've got this. Because he says, Jesus says, I cast out demons by the Holy Ghost. You cast out demons by the Holy Ghost. You can holler and scream and he'll let you do all of that, but it's he, him, that has to get it done. It's the language of the Spirit. When he heals the sick, it's the Holy Ghost. Jesus can stand here and the centurion's servant can be out there and the centurion's servant can say, you don't have to come to my house, just say the word. Somebody say, say the word. Somebody else say, say the word. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. So Jesus is standing here in time and space. The servant is out there. And Jesus says, your servant is healed. And the Holy Spirit who is already there says, I've got this. Some of the things that you're believing God for, you think that God has to go somewhere in order to get it done. But God doesn't go anywhere. He's everywhere. If you give a roll call, anywhere in the universe, he can say present. Say, when you have the Holy Spirit, you can heal the sick. Because he does the work. Say it again. He does the work. So go with me real quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 
And as Britney Spears said to her second husband, I won't keep you long. I heard an evangelical teacher who was teaching on how ridiculous speaking in tongues was and I thought you really don't understand speaking in tongues why would God give us this language and he said that on the day of Pentecost they used speaking in tongues to preach the gospel but on the day of Pentecost Peter preached the gospel but as they were speaking in tongues, they weren't preaching the gospel. They were declaring the works of God. They were telling God how good he is. One of my friends was in Eastern Europe during the, the Iron Curtain days. And he said he was preaching to a small group of people in a home. And he says, I had to be translated three different times. And he said, we were praying for people to receive the Holy Spirit. And he says, I was praying for this little European peasant woman. And as I laid my hands on her to receive the Holy Spirit, she began to say, oh God, I praise you. You are an amazing God. How wonderful you are. You are awesome. And he said, I said to her, honey, don't speak English. Speak in tongues. He said, and then it dawned on me. She wasn't English. She was speaking in tongues. In English. speaking in tongues listen to how Paul describes it in chapter 14 verse 1 he said one who speaks in a tongue verse 2 I'm sorry does not speak to men but to God for no one understands him but in his spirit he speaks mysteries when you're speaking in tongues you're not speaking to men but to God when you're speaking in tongues you have access to the Godhead you have access to the throne you have access to a continual conversation that's taking place you're communing with God in a way that you can't understand your understanding is unfruitful but your Holy Spirit charged spirit is communing with God he speaks to God and not to men I had our kids saying grace one day pastor and so when it came time for the youngest to say the grace, I said, Kip, it's your turn. He bowed his head and he started eating. And I said, did you pray? He said, yes, dad. I said, I didn't hear you. He said, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> He's alive. He's still alive. I mean, it was, it was close. I wanted to take that guy and just... But then I realized, he's not talking to me. S say this, speaking in tongues is not speaking to men. Speaking in tongues is speaking to God. Speaking in tongues is not understood. Speaking in tongues is speaking mysteries. I've had moments in speaking in tongues when I just felt this glorious lifting, just caught up in the presence of God, and just, oh, go, share, see, all, and anything, and you're feeling like, oh, this is so good, and you know you're saying something of value because your, your spirit is being lifted, and you're, you're discovering, I'm not just a human being having a temporary spiritual experience, I'm a spiritual being having a temporary human experience, and every now and then, this Thing in me communicates with that thing that gave me existence this spirit in me this person in me that's a real person wants to communicate with the real God but I don't have the language to do it and he knows how frustrated you can be when Peter says it's joy and it's unspeakable when something is unspeakable it means you can't speak it how good do you feel? Oh, I wish I could tell you. But when the Spirit of God comes, He touches your life, and that joy floods your soul, and you become she sabala, and tears coming down your face, and you're having this moment, and you want to know. And I asked him one day, I said, God, what was I saying? He said, if I tell you, I got to kill you. <laughs> I said, never mind. It's okay. 
it was a good experience you speak mysteries it's wonderful it's hard to understand it's awesome and people say well, what are you doing I was walking along the street one day and I like to do this I like to walk and sing in tongues that's how I exercise my vocal cords I, I, I figure do re mi fa sa la ti do that's wasted that's just foolish why, why do that when you can say So I call it the language of wonder. Say it. It's the language of wonder. The language of mystery. And then drop down to verse 4. One who speaks in the tongue does what? Edifies. The word edify is the Greek word that means to build. You build yourself. One who edifies builds himself. If I want to do exercise, I'll get on a bike and I'll ride and I am building up my leg strength. I'm building up my oxygen. I'm doing all of that. If I want to run, I'll do that and I'll do that. And I'll lift weights and I'm building up my arm strength. If I want to build up this person inside, then I pray in the Holy Ghost. You, beloved, Judith said it like this, and you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith doing what praying in the Holy Ghost praying in the Holy Ghost it's the language of work you can pray in tongues while you're cutting grass you can pray in tongues while you're changing the diaper guys you can pray you can pray in tongues while you're washing dishes guys you can Pray in tongues when you're losing in basketball. I mean, you can pray, there are all kinds of things you can do. You can pray, and while you're praying in tongues, you're building yourself up. You're strengthening yourself. You're changing an atmosphere. Paul says it to the Ephesians like this. He says, be not foolish, but wise. Knowing that this is the time of redeeming the time. And he says, and be not drunk with wine. Be not drunk with wine. Say that, please. Say it again. But be filled with the Spirit. Contrast. Be not drunk with wine, which takes over your personality, but be filled with the Spirit, which takes over your personality. He says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and in hymns and in spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And that takes me to verse 7. He says, yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp and producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in tones, how would it be known what is played on the flute or on the harp? It's the language of worship. There are times when, when I'm in a foreign country and they're singing a song and I know it's got Holy Ghost all over it, but I can't speak Indonesian. I can't speak those languages. And so I'll look at the words for a minute, I'll listen to the melody and I'll ignore the words and I'll just sing the melody in tongues. You can sing any song you've ever heard in tongues any song because tongues is the language of worship I could sing our national anthem in tongues in tongues I could sing it in tongues I could sing an opera in tongues you don't have to limit yourself. I don't know that song. You don't have to know the song. Just know your own song. Know your capability in worship and just begin to worship him. Begin to tell him how good he is. And when you run out of English words and whatever your language is, just, just move over into this other dimension where you're saying, Just sing in the same key. So we sing a song. You're all I want. You're all I've ever needed. You're all 
all I want Help me know you are me. Amen Since I can sing in the spirit And I can sing with an understanding I'll just say Shema Lady Come sarà reshiva Come lara Che amani sea are you getting this? Way back there. Are you getting this way back there? See, some people sit way back there because they don't want to get back there. He starts back there. Shamalini. I belong to a health club pastor. And I'm sitting in the health club in the sauna. And I'm having this moment with God. And this guy comes in and he says hello. But he adds some profanity to it. He doesn't say, hello, how are you? He says, how in the sun are you? And I'm saying, I'm okay. And I'm, I'm thinking, I paid money to be here, not to hear that. And I said, God, this isn't fair. He says, change the atmosphere. I said, how do I do that? He said, you see that steam coming out of the pipe over there? I said, yes. He said, add your steam to that steam. I said, what should I do? He said, just sing in the, in the spirit. So I sat there. You got to get there early. And I got there early and I'm sitting. He comes in. He says, Hey, how are you? And I said, I'm fine. They don't stay long. <laughs> and somebody else comes in. Hey, how's it going? It's saying it's going good. Look, you can clean out an elevator. Speaking in tongues. Just let the door close. It's crowded and they're pushing on you. Just say, Come on. Boom, 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 boom. It'll be empty. It's the language of worship. Come on, lift your hands. It's the language of worship. It's, it's, it's a gift that God has given you. Just sing a song to him. Just use your prayer language.
And right in the middle of one of those sweet moments, something comes in and says, Kesanti Whoa, what was that? Here's where Paul says, if the trumpet plays an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? Tongues is the language of worship, but it's also the language of warfare. Because there's some things that aren't going to get way until you come after it in a word, in a language that God gives you for that moment. You don't know what you're declaring, but he knows what you're declaring. He said, Tamore. I said, they can't do so. but Intercessors are the most interesting people. They don't care how they look. What are they doing? They're expressing warfare in different ways. Shooting an arrow, pounding the ground, hands lifted. Those are weapons of warfare. Mother comes and she says, pray for me. My son, he says he's not coming to church. And I said, how old is he? He's 12. Does he live with you? Yes. Sleep in your bed? Yes. You buy his groceries? Yes. Where's his dad? She said, he's gone. I said, do you have a war tongue? She said, what's a war tongue? I said, it's when you're praying. And you say, Kanase le minikia taba. She sakando. You ever, you guys have war tongues here? You all pray in tongues? You all pray in tongues here? No. Thank you. Are you speaking for yourself or for the whole group? Shabala de ting musaka shanga. So I said to her, I said to this mother, I said, if he says to you one more time, I'm not coming to church. Look at him for a moment and point a finger at him like Seely did in the color purple. <laughs> and just look at him for a moment and just say, Kesane kule shela kamesa yendila kuposeto shamoka yaka posela. He said that next Sunday, should I wear a tie? Cause this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Stand up with me. This is how I fight my battles. service say I'm not going home the 
same way I can. See, I'm not going home the same way I can. I've got some weapons. I'm going to start using them. I've got some warfare tools, and I'm going to start using them. says, Come on, link with someone. Just connect. Pastor, would you come join me? The Bible says, Be filled with the Spirit. Paul says, you can be filled with the Spirit speaking in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When Paul and Silas were in prison, the Bible says they started singing spiritual songs. God says, I'm going down there. Sing a song that attracts his attention. Sing a song that will get him into your circumstances. Sing a song that will break open the prison doors for you, for your children, and for your nation.